Good afternoon. My name is Alex White. I'm Director General of the Institute of International and European Affairs. And I'm pleased to welcome you uh, to this IIEA webinar addressing um, certain important legal aspects of the ongoing conflict um, in the Middle East. Um, in July of this year, as I'm sure you're aware, the International Court of Justice issued an advisory opinion um, when the occupation by Israel of Palestinian territories post-1967 was, was declared to be illegal. And that request for an opinion um, from the court was made by the General Assembly of the United Nations. It has to be distinguished um, from a separate ICG, ICJ case, an application brought by South Africa under the Genocide uh, Convention. And in that case, um, uh, the court issued so-called provisional measures uh, back in January of this year, requiring the state of Israel, quote, in accordance with its obligations under the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide in relation to Palestinians in Gaza, to take all measures within its power to prevent the commission of all acts within the scope of Article 2 of the Convention, unquote. Um, entirely separately, again, there is the application by the Chief Prosecutor of the International Criminal Court for arrest warrants in respect of the Israeli Prime Minister and the Minister for Defence, as well as of three senior Hamas figures. So, and there are other um, um, cases ongoing internationally um, which touch on important questions of international law which um, we are going to explore in this seminar here at the IIA this afternoon. Thank you, as I say, for joining us. Um, our panel, I'll introduce them in a moment. We have three um, experts joining us. Um, they'll set out their uh, views on these legal developments. And um, we're, of course, confining as best we can the discussion to these legal issues, but of course, um, um, we may range um, uh, be beyond the strictly legal questions, but that's the basis for our uh, conversation this afternoon. And we'll have an opportunity in that context also to reflect on Ireland's position uh, on these uh, questions of international law as, as have uh, arisen in the course of the, um, the cases I mentioned, noting that the Attorney General, uh, Ross of Fanning, appeared personally um, at the hearing in The Hague last February uh, in, relation to the, um, in relation to the General Assembly uh, request for an opinion um, and made, I think it would be generally agreed to be some very trenchant uh, submissions on that occasion on behalf of Ireland. Uh, we're also aware that the government in recent days has said that it is again considering uh, how to proceed with the Occupied Territories Bill, uh, which would restrict trade with Israeli settlements in the West Bank. And the Tanish, the uh, stated in recent days that the Attorney General has advised that, and I quote, the context of how we might move forward on this issue has now changed because of the International Court of Justice's advisory opinion uh, in July. So there's a lot that we could talk about. Um, and as I mentioned, we're pleased to be joined today by three legal experts. Uh, Julia Pinzotti is Assistant Professor of Public International Law at Leiden University. Uh, Dr. John Reynolds is Associate Professor of International Law at Maynooth University, and Professor Ellen Tegruja is Professor of Public International Law at Aix Marseille University. And she is delayed uh, just by uh, a few minutes, uh, I'm advised, but we're hopeful that Ellen will be in a position to join us shortly. But we can go, first of all, uh, to our first, first of our three speakers. Uh, Julia Pinzotti is Assistant Professor of Public International Law at the Grotius Centre uh, for International Legal Studies of Leiden Law School. She previously served as an Associate Legal Officer at the International Court of Justice from 2015 to 2016 uh, in, the officer, uh, in the Office of the Prosecutor of the Inter International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslav Yugoslavia from 2012 to 2014, and also at the Special Tribunal for Lebanon. Uh, back in 2011-2012. So uh, um, qualified, certainly, without doubt, and I'm sure with many insights, uh, we would ask you, Julia, maybe just as our first speaker, to just give us the general context for, for these cases that have arisen internationally, where we are in relation to them, and just a, a, a broad opening for us for our conversation. Over to you. 
thanks very much for the introduction for having me today. In the time that I have, I'd like to give you a brief overview of the ICJ's engagement with the situation in Palestine and to explain the court's key findings in the cases so far. So first of all, I think it's important to mention that for about 56 years since the beginning of Israel's occupation, it wasn't possible to begin a contentious case against Israel in relation to the occupation itself, because the court's contentious jurisdiction, that is um, its work on the settlement of international disputes has certain limits, most notably it's based on consent of the state parties to a particular dispute. Now, consent to the jurisdiction of the ICJ can be expressed in two main ways, through treaties or through the so-called optional clause declarations. But Israel typically doesn't consent to ICJ jurisdiction with the exception of the Genocide Convention, and that's why the Convention is so important. I'll come back to that. So the court's only engagement with the situation in Palestine for a long time was through advisory opinions. These opinions can be requested by the General Assembly or the Security Council on any legal questions. So in 2003, the General Assembly requested the court to deliver an advisory opinion on the legality of the construction of the wall in the occupied Palestinian territory by Israel. Because this is an opinion, it's not binding, consent is not required in this case, but in practice, it is a way to bring contentious matters before the court through the back door, so to say. So in 2004, the court ruled that the wall and the legal regime associated with it are uh, contrary to international law. It's, the wall is a fact on the ground uh, that may well be, become permanent, the court said, and in that case, it would amount to de facto annexation of parts of uh, Palestine's territory by Israel. The court also spelled out the consequences of the legality that Israel must dismantle the wall and provide compensation for the harm caused, which of course didn't happen as we know. Then we fast forward to December 2022 when the General Assembly requested a second advisory opinion from the court that was just mentioned on the legality of Israel's occupation. But while these advisory proceedings were ongoing, the 7th of October attacks happened and Israel's massive military response on and against the Gaza Strait. So this is what triggered the initiation of two contentious cases against Israel and one of its closest ally, Germany, for their role in the conflict. The first case was brought by South Africa against Israel on the basis of Article 9 of the Genocide Convention. Uh, this article provides that any disputes related to the interpretation or application of the convention can be brought uh, before the International Court of Justice. And you may wonder, why South Africa that is not directly injured by the alleged commission of genocide in the Gaza Strip. It's possible for South Africa to bring this case because the obligations enshrined in the Genocide Convention are not simply bilateral obligations that are owed to one state to another state, but they are owed by each state party to all of the other state parties. And this gives every state party the standing to bring a case against any other state party concerning alleged violations of the convention, even if it's not directly injured by the violation. South Africa's case at its core is that Israel has um, violated the Genocide Convention uh, by committing genocide against Palestinians in Gaza and by failing to prevent it. Genocide is a very serious crime whose essence is, in brief, the destruction of a protected national, ethnic, racial or religious group in whole or in part. And in its application, South Africa argues that Israel is killing Palestinians in large numbers through its relentless pounding of the Gaza Strip. It's causing them serious bodily mental harm, imposing measures that are intended to prevent Palestinians Palestinian birds within the group and inflicting conditions of life that are calculated to bring about the destruction of the group in the long run through the deprivation of food, water, fuel, uh, medical uh, supplies. 
So while this case might take several years to reach a uh, ruling on the merit, uh, South Africa has asked the court to issue uh, provisional measures. These are urgent measures that are needed to protect the Palestinian people from further harm and ensure safeguard uh, South Africa's ability to have the case fairly adjudicated um, in the merits uh, pending resolution of the case. The court has already indicated provisional measures three times. Three times it has warned Israel, its allies, and the whole international community that Palestinians in Gaza are at risk of genocide. Um, the measures that uh, the court indicated in its decisions have become, I would say, increasingly more specific, um, more detailed. If we look at the latest decision from May 2024, um, the court uh, reaffirmed the measures that it indicated previously in January and in March, including the cessation of any genocidal acts, the delivery of humanitarian assistance to Gaza's population, but it also ordered Israel to suspend its military operations in Rafah governorate, um, something that had been uh, debated a lot amongst legal scholars, um, probably was already implicit in previous decisions, but in May the court said it very loud and clear. It ordered Israel to maintain the Rafah crossing open for the delivery of humanitarian aid, and ordered Israel to grant unimpeded access to the Strip by UN investigative bodies. So the court really sent a strong message to um, Israel and to the, to the entire uh, world. It's also uh, undeniable and regrettable that Israel didn't comply with the court's orders. Um, this is in itself a violation of international law because provisional measures orders are binding. So when the court will issue a decision on the merits, it will ascertain um, that Israel breached the provisional measures orders. But we cannot wait until then. You know, this might take a few years from now. We need to act right now. And whether the court's rulings that are so important will be able to protect Palestinians in Gaza or not actually depends on the actions of third states, including Ireland and international organizations, because they are the actors that have the capacity to influence Israel's actions. Not just that, they're legally obliged to do so because of their own obligations to prevent genocide as states parties to the convention and not to be complicit in Israel's violations of the convention. And I believe that Dr. Reynolds will further elaborate on this point. I just want to briefly mention another, the other contentious case that was brought by Nicaragua versus Germany. It's really against this uh, backdrop of the South Africa case that Nicaragua instituted proceedings against Germany, arguing that through its continued provision of military assistance to Israel, Germany is failing in its own obligation to prevent genocide and to ensure respect for the Geneva Conventions. Nicaragua also requested the indication of provisional measures to ensure that the weapons already delivered by Germany to Israel wouldn't be used to commit or to facilitate um, the Commission of International Violations and to enjoin Germany to resume its fund financial support for UNRWA. On the facts presented by uh, Germany and accepted by the court, the court declined to indicate provisional measures uh, this time, but it didn't throw the case uh, out as Germany had requested. It remained seized of the case and took the opportunity to express its deep concerns for the grave humanitarian situation in Gaza and to affirm that state parties to the Genocide Convention, to the Geneva Conventions, have the duty to be proactive in ascertaining and avoiding the risk that when they supply weapons to a party to a conflict, that these weapons might be used to violate the convention. So the implications of this case, um, I think are very um, far reaching and certainly more than one might uh, uh, think. If you look back on these cases, um, the court's findings are based on a very low standard of proof because we're at the provisional measure stage. So the court has only ascertained that genocide is plausible. 
this is a much lower standard than the fully conclusive proof that is required to make a finding on the merits that genocide was committed. <laughs> Excuse me. But still, I think that no state should ever get to the point where genocide is even plausible because of the seriousness of the allegations. The allegations of um, genocide, I think, also have a very particular symbolic force due, of course, to the Holocaust um, in a way that perhaps other international crimes uh, do not. The flip side of that is that in these contentious cases, the court's jurisdiction is limited to ascertaining allegations of genocide, which provides the basis for the court's jurisdiction and genocide only. So the court cannot uh, consider um, uh, IHL compliance or other violations of international law. But this is why I think the advisory proceedings on the legality of the occupation are so important because they have this much broader um, scope. In July, as was mentioned, the court concluded that <laughs> the occupation is illegal. So it's Israel's very presence in the occupied Palestinian territory is contrary to international law. This illegality stems from a number of policies and practices, such as the settlements, for example, um, that constitute um, unlawful acquisition of territory by force and breach the right of the Palestinian people to self-determination. The court has also characterized Israel discriminatory legislation as um, apartheid or a racial segregation. There's a little bit of ambiguity there and address the consequences for Israel that must terminate the occupation and provide reparation and also for third states and the UN. So uh, groundbreaking decisions in a decision in, in many respects in significance and, and scope. And I'm going to leave it at that. Thank you very much for that um, uh, um, wonderful just summary of, uh, I mean, issues of enormous import and um, seriousness um, and almost it, you often feel, I'm sure, uh, as an academic, that it can be not not assuming this, but it's it's very difficult to reduce issues of such enormity to seven minutes or whatever it is that you've done. But thank thank you for, for, for that. And there's much there to discuss. And I think struck by what you said at the outset that which is which we're aware of, but it's it's it it, it bears repeating that all state parties have an interest. I mean in a sense on the question of standing Every state has a, has standing, uh, um, and it's quite a profound a point um, to 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 remember in these in these in these matters that sometimes the, the the pushback can be well look where's the interest involved or where's the you know where's the involvement or what but the point you make is that as as you know as a matter of law, um, international law, all states have standing on these questions, and 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 that's something that's worth bearing in mind. Um, I'm going to go next to uh, John Reynolds, um, is Associate Professor of International Law at the School of Law and Criminology at Maynooth University. And John's research focuses on questions of international law in relation to colonialism, apartheid and states of emergency. Um, his book on empire, emergency and international law was published with uh, Cambridge University Press and won the Kevin Boyle uh, uh, Book Prize for Outstanding legal um, scholarship. John, I'm going to ask you just to pick up perhaps there and where Yulia left off to reflect on some of those um, cases that she has spoken of and perhaps also to take a, a moment to reflect on Ireland's role, Ireland's involvement, particularly on the advisory opinion case um, and where uh, uh, what the implications that might be domestically here in terms of how we approach the Occupied Territories Bill. But um, take it wherever you choose. It's over to you. Thanks for joining us, John. Sure. Yeah. Thanks very much for the for the invitation. So I'll try and address primarily, I think, those those questions are in relation to Ireland and how this how this does impact Ireland's role and involvement. Um, that might be, I think, the most interesting to focus on. But uh, still, the, the time is obviously limited, so I'm happy to talk more in the discussion afterwards. I will just start with one, uh, I suppose, element of, of context or a caveat um which i'm kind of compelled just to mention just based on my, my own research that you mentioned and the, and the background i'm coming from on this which is about international laws 
um, uh, complicity really historically for for a long time in colonial power dynamics and in imperial European imperialism in the world. And, you know, the, we, we have a long history of 500 years of international law really being a vehicle for um, imperialism and, and injustice in many ways. And it's only really slowly changing since the 1960s, really since the former colonized nations have become part of the UN and, and that we have a more democratic kind of international order, um, at least on paper since then that, you know, things have started to change. And so the, 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 the International Court of Justice is part of that, is not immune from that, and, and does have its own uh, somewhat patchy history as well on, on questions of, of global justice, self-determination. Um, uh, and, you know, we can think of, you know, some quite conservative and problematic decisions from the court in the 1960s, for example, kind of more or less in favour of apartheid South Africa at the time where some of its policies were being challenged by, by Ethiopian Li Liberia. Um, other situations that have come up since then, famous case in the 1980s, um, where there was a strong decision against the US over its illegal intervention and use of force in, in Nicaragua, uh, where the court found it, you know, to have breached international law, reparations being due, but that wasn't enforced. And, and, and the US used its veto on the Security Council to, to block that. And so we have, you know, these um, um, kind of difficult dynamics there and uh, the kind of uh, in, in inter, the engagement by global south states particularly has been um you know affected by that there was a, a disillusionment with the court after the the failure to enforce the Nicaragua decision and it's only really in recent years that the global states south states particularly have been more actively engaged with with the court and are really the ones that have been taking the lead, you know, on on um, in the international institutions and in international relations generally on on Palestine in recent years and recent decades and obviously particularly in the past year uh, with South Africa and Nicaragua taking these cases themselves in the International Court of Justice, but also some of the other global South countries imposing trade measures, diplomatic sanctions, and 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 other measures against against Israel. So when it comes to Ireland's role, we've obviously had a lot of strong words and and some kind of gestures towards symbolic action from, from Ireland but very little action really during during the past year of Israel's genocide or, or really over the past number of of that decades where the not just legal but also moral imperatives of, of taking action against the Israeli occupation the apartheid regime have been clear for a long time going back to the the original advisory opinion that Julia mentioned 20 years ago and and before that and so um in terms of the implications of these of these um, uh, rulings, let's say between the advisory opinion and the various provisional measures orders this year for for Ireland, I'll try and just emphasise maybe a couple of points for now, and I'm happy to pick it up then in the, in the discussion again afterwards. But one, I suppose, is as as you've kind of alluded to on the um, the advisory opinion on the illegal occupation and what that tells us, or you know what that means for the Occupied Territories Bill and related trade issues. And so speak a little bit to that. And then the other um, second point, if, if I have time, I, I just on the provisional measures orders in the 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 two cases, in particular the, the, the South Africa case and what that means for, you know, Ireland's um, obligations to prevent genocide and not to not to aid or assist genocide and war crimes, which also comes into play with the, with the Nicaragua decision as well. John, so, would you mind if I just interrupt for one brief moment, just to remind everybody sure. who's watching that they can um, insert a question into the q and I, I overlooked doing that at the outset, and I wanted to, once it's just occurred to me, I want to do it as soon as I can. If you're interested and you've got a question, uh, please put it into the Q&A. Um, tell us who you are, if you don't mind. Some people already have done it. Um, give us your your name, certainly, and your designation if you have one, and we get to those questions once we've heard from our panellists. And the shorter and the pithier, if that's the word, question uh, you put in, the more likely uh, we are to reach it. Sorry to interrupt you, John. I thought you mightn't mind me just doing that. Yeah, that's no bother at all, yeah. So on the advisory opinion, I mean, Julius kind of laid it out well there, but we have these the, the duty basically not to recognise, not to aid or assist, uh, in any way, the illegal occupation or what all, the court also talks about as annexation and as a regime of se racial segregation and apartheid in the Palestinian territory that Israel has imposed. And so the language, some of the key language from the advisory opinion is around it. Let's say if we take Ireland's obligation in this in this case, so Ireland's obligation, the obligation of all states to to abstain 
from treaty relations with Israel in all cases in which it purports to act on behalf of the Palestinian territory, to abstain from entering into economic or trade dealings with Israel concerning the occupied territory, which may entrench its unlawful presence in the territory, and also to take steps to prevent trade or investment relations that assist in the maintenance of the illegal situation created by Israel in the Palestinian territory. Right? There's more to it. Uh, there's more elements, but there are some of the key uh, points that the court makes. And it really, you know, the upshot is that this really requires all states, uh, including Ireland, to to really fully review their diplomatic, political, economic, cultural, military relations with, with Israel on all fronts. There was then a General Assembly resolution in September that uh, gave effect to the advisory opinion, endorsed it, and also um, called for the, the illegal occupation to be ended within within a period of 12 months. And Ireland voted in favour of that resolution, but also, I think, significantly co-sponsored it as well. And so the, the position rhetorically from, from the government uh, has been clear. And so one question that comes up then is what, what does that mean in terms of concrete action? The uh, Occupied Territories Bill obviously has been in the, um, the discussion, as you mentioned recently. Uh, you know, the, the basic kind of element of banning imports from Israeli settlements is you know, very evidently in not just in line with, but, but required by what the advisory opinion says. Um, that was clear, I think, already from, you know, 2004 and the original advisory opinion, which dealt very comprehensively with the illegality of the settlements. And so, you know, in one sense, the best time to pass the Occupied Territories Bill was in 2018, when it had already the, the parliamentary majority at that point. Um, but as we know, it was blocked by by the government at the time. Uh, the next best time, I suppose, um, is, is now uh, to do so. And, you know, it, I think it's... Um, it's clear that that's in many ways, you know, the the minimal obligation that the advisory opinion would require. And actually, if we look at the the language of it, you know, it's it's not just about banning uh, relations with the illegal settlements themselves, but it's about um, abstaining from trade or economic dealings, which in any way may entrench the unlawful presence in the Palestinian territory or assist in its continuation. So it's not just about direct trade with the set with the settlements itself. It's about the broader economic and trade dealings with the Israeli state. And I think one thing that is important to, to emphasize, you know, we international law makes a very kind of clear distinction. There is a green line between 1948 and 1967 Palestine, and that's the partition line. And that's how we separate the, the territory. But in the way that the Israeli state and the Israeli economy operates, that dividing line is, you know, is, is, um, is not so clear at all. And in many ways it's non-existent. And we see, you know, even the, the Israeli Prime Minister going to the UN General Assembly and holding up the map of Israel, and there's no partition line there. It's all Israel, Israel, and the Palestinian territory is all considered as Israel. And so, when you know, when one of the figures that co that's come up in relation to the Occupied Territories Bill is that there's around uh, approximately a million euros worth of of um, imports from Ireland directly from the the Israeli settlements uh, annually. Um, that so I'm not sure exactly the you know how accurate the, the the source of that figure, but if that if we take that as you know as as a, a million euro per year, and we look at the overall imports from Ireland from Israel into Ireland in 2023, for example, it was close to four billion. And so if we you know if we if we put those figures side by side, we think about how the Israeli economy operates. We think about how so much of the trade that is happening is not you know is um. There, there's points in the in the production line or the, or the value chain that are you know is maybe originating from from a settlement or from inside the, the occupied territory but coming through Israel and so you know the one one million out of out of four billion is a tiny fraction of a of a percentage but the territory of the Palestinian territory uh, control as part of Israel's overall jurisdiction is is 22 percent of the territory altogether the settler population in the west bank is is around up to up to around 10 percent of the israeli population and so it is a, a much more significant um factor than those figures might make us believe and clearly the um you know the level of of trade ireland is now um our israel's fourth largest export market it is a huge uh, level of trade particularly in the in the tech and electronic components sector and so you know in in many ways the obligations uh set out by the advisory opinion requires to go a lot further than just the you know what's labeled and clearly designated as coming directly from from um 
from an illegal settlement. And so that does require that that much more um extensive kind of review, I think, of the um of the the interactions mm. we have. And we can think about, you know, questions of um, you know, th- that language about assisting in the maintenance of the illegal situation, the role of, you know, the, the, you know, the, the role of the big tech companies and their relations with the Israeli security s- s- uh, apparatus and military as well, documented Amazon, Google, and so on, but also uh, companies like Motorola and others that are you know very actively providing um surveillance technology to the settlements and the settlement infrastructure and the security kind of arrangements that go around that and so it it penetrates a lot a lot deeper than just you know particular products that are grown themselves on on settlement um on lands and so I think ending trade with the settlements is is the first step but 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 it, it that would only partly meet the duty not to aid or assist the the unlawful occupation. Mm-hmm.